Uh, we got word that there is a jury question in the Karen Reed case. We are waiting to get that actual question. We will, of course, get that to you and find out what that means at this point, nearly 18 and a half uh, plus hours into their deliberation. So we're going to talk about all kinds of stuff, including that as we uh, continue to wait for the jury's verdict there. Uh, six men, six women, they've all been deliberating now for, it's pushing really 19 hours. Remember, Reed's accused of second degree murder in the death of her Boston police officer boyfriend, John O'Keefe. Prosecutors say that she struck her boyfriend with her SUV after a night of drinking. The defense says that their client uh, is being framed. It's a massive cover-up by the parties who have deep ties to law enforcement. So this trial has been gaining a lot of attention. And, uh, and look, look at the supporters out there. We see them outside the courthouse every day. Uh, and now as the verdict looms, they're getting more vocal. I want to take a listen now to one supporter who gives his overall thoughts on the case as this jury is out deliberating. It's, so, it's such a complicated case that, um, you know, you can spend whole days reading, you know, and still learning new stuff. But I mean, I'm here to, because I feel it's a miscarriage of justice, uh, rehoming the dog, the, the deleting the video evidence, the, the losing the evidence of the, um, the arm, the, uh, you know, the, the, the tissue from the, the DNA. This just so clearly manipulating the case. And I mean, the, there's so many things I could bring up, but I mean, Proctor knowing Brian Albert right from the get go and he didn't he didn't take himself off the case and he lied about it, you know, and then got caught. They're all they're so clearly lying about everything. The phone calls that they're trying to call their butt dials. It's, it's a butt dial, you don't answer it. You know, were they butt answers? They're just clearly lying about, you know, so many things. Innocent people don't have to lie. So when I went to law school, I wasn't sure butt dials was going to be part of my you know, need and lexicon. But nonetheless, in this case, it is. Hey, joining me to talk about this case and the current deliberations is trial attorney Catherine Lazardo. Catherine, it's always good to see you. Um, boy, we have a jury question coming up. We are going to take that uh, live as soon as everybody gets seated. The uh, parties are returning to the courtroom, as, of course, is the jury. That's the way it works. They'll read that question, and we'll go from there. Uh, Catherine, what do you think? Because there's been a day and a half of pretty much, uh, you know, just silence from this jury. What could this be? Well, it's a, a lot of evidence that they have to go through. That's why a day and a half, I'm not that surprised that it's they're still deliberating. Let's remember, this was an eight-week trial, almost ended up a 10-week trial. There are so many witnesses to remember uh, on both sides, and so the jury has to call through that. And I think the jury questions that they will have are relating to those evidence. Maybe they want to see more evidence again, uh, when I say more evidence, another evidence that they saw at trial that they want to review. Again, with all of those information that was given before them, videos, pictures like that, uh, about the broken taillight especially, they might likely ask for those evidence to re-review. Yeah, and we'll definitely get into that whole taillight thing soon enough. I'm thinking too that maybe, you know, uh, it's been four days total, parts of four days, uh, and there were questions early on, and then nothing for a day and a half, so maybe this is that you know, judge, what do we do? We can't figure it out. Uh, we don't have a, uh, a unanimous decision possible. The other issue in this case that's been interesting is poor Chloe the dog. Um, you know, Chloe the dog rehomed. I, th I think that, you know, that's what they say now. I think that they got rid of the dog. Uh, there had been some bite history. Obviously, there's a suggestion by the defense in this case that those injuries right there were caused by a dog, and Chloe was the only one uh, at, at the residence that night. So what's your take on the importance of the dog evidence or the injury evidence or the Chloe evidence? Well, there wasn't much that we can glean on in terms of the experts saying that it was not a canine evidence uh, of a dog and that whether or not it's directly tied to that dog, Chloe. So I suspect looking at those injuries, quite honestly, this is my speculation, of course, is that it might be an animal that uh, made those marks, but not necessarily the dog. So we'll see what the jury feels about that. Yeah, and maybe most importantly, having heard from both sides, I'm not sure we know the cause of those injuries. We've got a couple of ideas. The uh, prosecution saying it was the taillight, broken, jagged edges. You know, it's out there. Uh, and of course, the, the, the dog theory. I'm looking at the courtroom camera uh, right now, uh, Catherine, and we're still seeing the hypnotizing 
spinning fan. <laughs> so as soon as they pull out and show the courtroom itself, we'll know they're about ready to do something with that, uh, that question. Uh, so in the meantime, let me ask you this. If you're in this jury, you know, four days, that's, a, you know, there's, there's this theory that it's a day of deliberation for every week of trial. I, I think that's garbage. I, I, you know, it just doesn't play out all that often. But if that were true, uh, you know, this is a reasonable time period within which this jury would be chewing over this case because there is so much going on and so many lesser included. So let's talk about those lesser included. Uh, where do you think those might fall in this jury's uh, review? Are they things that would be dismissed or are they really need to get into the nitty gritty to see if they apply to Karen Reed? Well, it's interesting because uh, one of the things that the defense wanted to add to the jury instruction is the not guilty box in those um, lesser included because they want to make sure that um, if it was there, that the jury can consider that as well to be really clear that you can uh, choose that option. These jury instructions, they can get really complicated. I mean, they're thick right there with all the jury instruction and then the verdict form you want that to be as specific as possible and easy for the jury to deliberate on so i agree with you that i think at this point uh, earlier on the first few days they were calling through what the evidence would be presenting all of that making sure who has their thoughts heard and then now they are likely going through that jury verdict of course this is just speculation because the jury are uh, very well guarded, uh, I, I would assume, in Massachusetts as well, so that no one knows what's happening behind that deliberation room. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. And, and you know, we, we don't, maybe there's a juror issue. You know, we've lost a few jurors along the way here for most of the time, personal reasons. Who knows? Could be could be an issue with the juror. It is, you know, four days into this process uh, and the deliberations, it's, it's an intense process. So as we wait for that question, again, looking at the ceiling fan spinning in that Massachusetts courtroom, uh, we know it's coming as everybody is gathering. Uh, and we'll find out if it's uh, an evidentiary question or perhaps a, uh, you know, what do we do if we're, we're deadlocked? You know, it's important to note, Catherine, give me your thoughts on this. You know, you could have a decision on some of the initial questions, second degree murder, uh, voluntary mass. You could have those decided. And those will stand even if there is a hung jury, which leads to a mistrial, right? Yes, exactly. And so when the jury goes through that jury verdict, that's why I mentioned earlier, the jury verdict is so critical that the jury has to look at each of those elements and say, okay, was this satisfied? Was this not satisfied? And we're going through the um, our uh, professor classroom point right now, and we see that verdict slip there. So if they answer the number one as not guilty, then that's it. They don't have to answer anymore but looking at that verdict that we just put up they go piece by piece because all of those elements are really important and then they are given instruction okay if this is what your answer is to this then go to this particular step so, yeah, so all of that gets answered and if they get to you know if it's a not guilty on the top charge second, those stand that, that that will be in place mm -hmm. even if they are hung on some of the lower decision making uh, so that's important to note you, you can have a hung jury mistrial that does have some weight uh, because those are co those are collaterally a stop type issues. Okay, so while we're waiting for the uh, span, uh, fan to stop spinning uh, and move into the broader shot of the courtroom, let's listen now to what, uh, again, we've been outside the courthouse talking with some of the rabid supporters out there, and I mean that in, in a good way. Let's talk to this supporter uh, with the thoughts on what he hopes the verdict will be. You know, she'll be cleared. Uh, she might get a DWI. I mean, I think she is guilty of that. But uh, I'm hoping it, it would be an outrage if she is found guilty of, of seeing this in her. It's interesting that, that she's just like an obscure person. She's, she wasn't a well-connected person. Nobody knows her, knew her beforehand. I didn't, you know. She was just kind of, a, I think she worked in finance and she was a part-time college professor. So none of us know her, but we, the philosophy is that could be any one of us, you know, could could be me, you know, getting framed by the police. And I, I come from a law enforcement family. My father was in law enforcement. My brother is retired. So I'm not anti-law enforcement. I'm, I'm anti-crooked law enforcement.
Okay, we're looking at, again at the courtroom to keep, uh, it, it looks like they're getting ready, so stand by just briefly here. Uh, so, you know, we've heard uh, that the jurors this morning looked a little fancy, a little more made up than maybe they had been. Oi, hold on, let's go back into the courtroom right now live. We have a jury question in the Reed case. Here we go. In consideration of all disputed evidence, we have been unable to reach a unanimous verdict signed by the four person. So I want to hear from counsel um, your view on whether there has been due and thorough deliberation. So let's start with the Commonwealth. Uh, my answer would be no, Your Honor. This simply hasn't been sufficient time yet. And what does the defense say? Uh, we believe that there has been sufficient time. All right, so I'll hear from both of you in more detail. Mr. Lally, I will hear you. Your Honor, the jury received this case uh, just a um, Earlier this week, uh, they, they've had uh, slightly shortened days, and, and I'm not in any way, shape, or form suggesting that they haven't conducted their due diligence in regard to uh, their deliberative process, but I would submit that it is far, far, far too early uh, in their deliberative process to even consider giving them any kind of uh, Tui Rodriguez instruction or anything close to that. Um, furthermore, what the note doesn't really indicate uh, affirmatively that they can't come to a conclusion. It just says that they haven't come to a conclusion uh, through their deliberative process at this time. Um, so it, they're not even asking for one, is what I would say. All right. Thank you. Ms. Giannetti, I'll hear you. <clears throat> Your Honor, I would disagree with Mr. Lally's characterization of the note. Um, the word exhaustive is the word, I think, that's operative here. Um, they're communicating to the court that they've exhausted all manner of uh, compromise, all manner of persuasion, uh, and they're at an impasse. Uh, you know, this is a, a, a case where the jury has the legal instructions. They've only really asked one question, which was to try to get a report that they were not allowed to get. Uh, and I think the message has been received that the evidence is closed. They won't get anything more. They've been working uh, essentially nonstop over the last, you know, three to four days. Uh, you know, we're, we're uh, approaching the, the weekend. Uh, they didn't come back with this at three o'clock or four o'clock. They're at 12 o'clock and they have nowhere to turn. So our position is the jury should be read the Tui Rodriguez model instruction and uh, go from there. Okay. All right, so you all know that it is within my discretion, I decide. So um, a case that has been, you know, it's a long case. This is our fourth day of deliberations, but Tuesday was a short afternoon, maybe two and a half hours. Um, Wednesday, they left early because of an appointment. Yesterday was um, also shortened a little bit. And this note arrived with less than three hours of deliberations today. So the, the length of the trial, the length of the deliberations, I know the case had, we heard from 74 witnesses, there are 657 exhibits, very complex issues in this case. I'm not prepared to find that there have been due and thorough deliberations at this point. So I am going to send them back out, we'll bring them in and we'll do that now. All right, so not a huge surprise, the judge deciding that uh, the jury has worked hard, but not hard enough. 
So they are uh, returning to the box. She will give them an instruction. I'm curious here to see whether or not she gives them the Allen charge, the dynamite charge. I've been looking at it, the one that they give in Massachusetts. Uh, and it's pretty typical, pretty typical. It basically says, hey, if you're uh, locked on conviction, give some thoughts to the other side of the argument. If you're locked on acquittal, give some thoughts to the other side of the argument. So let's see if she gives that specific instruction or just something more generic that suggests that, uh, that uh, you know, you, you uh, have worked hard to this point, but don't give up. I'm not giving up on you. Uh, there's nobody better to make this decision. Uh, and so that's the kind of pep talk we often see if it is not the very specific uh, dynamite or Allen charge that is codified. So let's go back in. Looks like the jury is impaneled. Let's see. Jurors, I'm in receipt of your note. I am writing to inform you on behalf of the jury that despite our exhaustive review of the evidence and our diligent consideration of all disputed evidence, we have been unable to reach a unanimous verdict signed by your four person. We all know how hard you've been working. Lunch will be arriving shortly. When it comes, I'd ask you to clear your heads, have lunch, and begin your deliberations again. So, or continue your deliberations. All right? So I'm sending you back out. All rise to the court, please. <coughs> Follow me, please. All right, short and sweet. Okay, coach, uh, he's encouraging the uh, panel to have a nice lunch, relax, think, get back at the deliberations. We're going to talk about it uh, when we come right back. Again, the Karen Reed case, the jury says, we, we, we've done all we can do. Judge says, no, you haven't. Get back to work. We'll be right back.